Hi, you're listening to the Saluki Games Cast. My name is Justin Young. This is episode 38 for February 17th, 2023. Joining me as always are Alicia Utech and OJ Duncan and special guest filling in this week, Carly Alvarez. Hello. Hey. Hey, Carly. How are you doing? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing fairly well. (laughs) Um, It's not quite that time of the semester yet. (laughs) Uh, but we'll check in with Alicia because I'm sure she'll tell us otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's only that time of the semester because I don't know how, you know, this has been week one with my new kitten. And I don't know how y'all have time for anything having lived with cats before <laughs> other than just watching the cat and playing with the cat and trying to keep him from eating cords. <laughs> <laughs> well, now a brand new kitten is a lot of work, but like as they age, you have to like pay them full attention a little bit less. Mm-hmm. And in fact, they actually, as they age, they want you to leave them alone <laughs> a little, you know, some of the time, but yeah, a brand new kitten wants your attention 24 hours a day. Yeah. I, you know, he's been very helpful writing emails to my students <laughs> in a- adding many exclamation marks and caps lock where there wasn't supposed to be. <laughs> I told my students actually just today in class, I said, don't email me at midnight I w- and expect me to respond to you that night. And I said, I will not probably be up, but as in my cat can respond to you, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just going to be random letters that he's like hitting. Yeah. So uh, what is the cat's name? Faramir. Oh, that's a good name. And this is a, I think you've mentioned uh, a little bit, you've talked about him on the podcast, but this is your first full week with him. And so he's a little orange kitty. He's a little orange kitty. He's about six months old and he's a rescue from a rescue back home in Minnesota called Paws for precious animals worth saving. Um, They are, Fantastic. My mom is friends with one of the ladies who runs it. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I needed a cat as an emotional support animal. And so, you know, a lot of cats tend to be very independent, very like not cuddly. Mm -hmm. And I need a cat that is cuddly. And I also need a cat that's not going to drive my allergies too crazy. (laughs) And so working with Paws, they were able, you know, it's three hours away from my hometown and, you know, 10 hours away from here. So I wasn't able to actually go and meet him before oh, mm-hmm. getting him. Mm-hmm. But they were super helpful in figuring out what kitty would be best for me. And, you know, they, I ended up meeting my mom and my sister halfway in Iowa to pick him up. But, like, they were, one of the volunteers there was like, yeah, I would have driven to Illinois for her, for him. Mm-hmm. I'm like, what? <laughs> That's a 10 hour drive. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. I mean, people who work for animal shelters are, you know, often just incredibly dedicated mm-hmm. to that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And like when I first, you know, when I, my original hope had been to get my cat over winter break and then I was having some troubles with my landlord. And so I was like, I don't think I can like, can I, can you guys recommend anyone in St. Louis or somewhere that I can drive to during the semester? Mm-hmm. And they were like, well, we can do inter, we can do cross state adoptions. I was like, hmm? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Tell me more. Tell me more. <laughs> well, so. Now you just need to get a copy of stray and, and <laughs> play it with him. <laughs> there we go. Now the cats- Only if I play it with him. Cause he, otherwise, how do I do anything? <laughs> <laughs> well, cats love that game. I think you, OJ, I think you said your mm-hmm. cat reacted to it when yeah. you played it. Yeah, dogs too. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, so everyone here is a cat owner, uh-huh. a cat parent. Okay. I do not own any cats. I am allergic to cats. Mm-hmm. Um, Same. Me yeah. too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. And so yet. <laughs> I'll probably end up on your wavelength eventually. But I have always wanted to get a hairless cat and name him Meatball. <laughs> yes. So hopefully that happens. Yes. Mm-hmm. Do it. Those those hairless cats have become very popular. I mean, I think for that exact reason, for people with allergies yeah. and everything to them. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Um, all right. Well, um, anyone else have anything they want to share before we jump into talking about games? 
I'm this week I started messing around with Instagram Reels and TikTok. So I am the social media manager for the School of Communication Studies here at SIU. And so I have no social media experience prior to this. So I've been practicing. And dare I say, I'm doing a very good job learning how to do Reels and TikToks. So <laughs> be on the lookout for our social media because you're probably going to see a lot of those very soon. Excellent. Let's go. <laughs> That's cool. I, I've done almost nothing with TikTok. Um, and despite the fact that I teach a class in social media, I just, <laughs> <laughs> there's like a new social media platform every mm-hmm. six there months. Is, yeah. And I'm, I'm always like, okay, I'll read about this and look at it, but I, I can't like have an account in this cause there's no way I'll actually ever do anything with it if I do. <laughs> Um, and then I feel like weird having people follow me and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to post <laughs> once and then never again. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I've already, um, uh, recently been trying to use Facebook less. So, um, I feel like I just need to get away from social media. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, all right, well, let's talk about games and Alicia, why don't you start us off? What have you been playing? Um, so, I guess I haven't been able to play a whole lot of games this week just because dealing with Faramir and getting him adjusted, but I did download the demo for the Kirby Return to Dreamland Deluxe Ooh. and played a little bit of that, and it's just so darn charming, you know? Yeah. Do I think it's anything particularly innovative or crazy good like Forgotten Land was? No, but it's it's Kirby. Like, how can you not... Love a Kirby game. <laughs> it, it, it's very much a... So I played it last week. We talked about it briefly. It's very much a classic Kirby-style game. Yeah. Like this is the most Kirby-ass Kirby <laughs> game yeah. you can imagine, really. Well, you know, the original one, the original version on the Wii is probably... I, I would say among the Kirby fandom, the two games I see the most love for is... Kirby 64, and the original Return to Dreamland. Mm-hmm. And so I know that there was a lot of cautious optimism around when they announced this game and being kind of like, okay, well, is it going to be as good as the Wii version? I never played the Wii version because I was broke, but... <laughs> I also never played the Wii version. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's it's just... It's one of those things that really reminds me like gaming is supposed to be fun Mm -hmm. you know i think i a lot of the gaming content that i consume is like challenge runs and not pokemon nuzlocks and Mm -hmm. all this stuff that it's like obviously the person doing it is having fun because if they didn't have fun with it they would just stop Mm -hmm. but like i look at that it stresses me the heck out (laughs) (laughs) or like you you look at some games and I'm just not very good at them. And so it ends up not being fun, but this is just easy, light, adorable. What more could you want? (laughs) Well, I think that was right. Part of the appeal of of Kirby and the forgotten land was that Mm -hmm. it was a 3d platformer in that sort of classic Mario 64, you know, crash bandicoot sort of style. Um, but it was just really accessible and pick up and play and yeah. like there was a challenge to it and you could make it more challenging and, you know, um, and some of the challenges that are, are in the game. Yeah. But and like, like, it was just really accessible. Anybody could pick up and play. Like, you know, if you haven't played a video game in the last 15 years, you could pick up that game and get into it. Yeah. And like on, so- on, you know, Sakurai's YouTube channel, he's done videos like talking about the different games that he was the main developer behind. And he talked about, you know, with the original Kirby game, making it so literally anyone could pick it up and play. Like you didn't have to do anything. You could literally float above every single Mm -hmm. enemy up Mm -hmm. to the boss Mm -hmm. just to make it accessible to new gamers, as well as having ways built in to make it more challenging if you want. And I, I just love that they've stayed true to that for Kirby all this time. What do you think of the art style? Because I know that was something that you had a question about last week. You know, it's growing on me. I think it. what's weird to me is like it looks better on the Switch than it does 
anywhere else. So like when I watched the trailer, you know, I watched it on my computer or I watched it on my phone or whatever. And it really, the cell shading looked almost awkward Mm -hmm. there, but then playing it on, on the switch, it actually works. I think I still wish that they used King DDD's old design rather than his forgotten land design, but the cell shading isn't as obnoxious. Isn't the word eye catching, I guess Mm. like when I, when I watched the trailers, it really stood out in not the best way. And so maybe distracting, distracting. Yeah. That's a good word. Like it was really distracting watching the trailers, but playing the game, it feels like it works a lot better. See, it didn't bother me at all. But I, I don't have the same, um, you know, background with Kirby. I've played some of the Kirby games and enjoyed them, but I, I don't have the same uh, fandom for mm-hmm. Kirby. So when I saw it, I was like, yeah, that's fine. Like, and, <laughs> yeah. you know, and the game itself looks really good in motion. So it never really bothered me um, in the same way that I think if they had done that with, say, Mario, uh, mm. I might have more of an issue with it. Yeah, um, but cool. I'm glad that you enjoy it. Um, you know, particularly I know you're a big Kirby fan, so love my boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that demo is up on Switch. That's free. That's for uh, Return to Dreamland Deluxe, and um, it, you know, that's the new one coming out. Is it this month? Is it later it's, this month? I think it's mid March. Okay, maybe it is into March. But it does have that new epilogue campaign. Yeah. That we have they a create it just for this. We have an epilogue campaign for Magalore. So I'm excited to see what that'll bring. Because Magalore has kind of become one of the Kirby enemies that really has lasted. Mm-hmm. You know, Nintendo's been posting storybook Kirby storybooks that were they have storybooks that were published in Japan. And then never brought anywhere else. Oh, wow. But so Nintendo has been posting read-alongs in, you know, English and Spanish and French and all of that. And the two antagonists, or I guess King DDD is an antagonist too, but... eh. (laughs) He's more of a frenemy at this point. Yeah. (laughs) The two antagonists who keep popping up in them are Magalore and Marx. So... Karl Marx. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> it would be interesting if Karl Marx just shows up in the next Kirby game. And, you know, I just let me tell you about the superstructure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I remember the Super Smash Bros. Brawl OST used to be my go-to when I was working on homework or something because it's eight and a half hours, and then they took down Nintendo copyright stru- the playlist. But all of the Marx themes, uh, the Marx theme video, all of the comments were like. Let us tell you about the superstructure. You're going up against the econ- against society, against economics, against everything. The most dangerous enemy of all. I was just lecturing on that today in class. <laughs> it's really weird how that comes up. Um, all right. So uh, playing with the kitten, playing a little bit of Kirby. Yep. It's been your week. All right. Well. You've got the best game, a new kitten. So, <laughs> <laughs> as long as as long as he stops chewing on cords. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a whole other game, right? Like, <laughs> it's almost <laughs> whack a mole at some point. <laughs> Stop that. <laughs> um, Carly, how about you? What have you been playing lately? So, I think the last time I was on the podcast, I mentioned I was playing with the game Dragon Ball Xenoverse 2 and I mm-hmm. had some uh I was expressing my dissatisfaction at the game and so around the time that we filmed or that we recorded that podcast I rage quit and I didn't touch <laughs> it for a long time however I've gotten really back into watching Dragon Ball Z and I was like well I guess I'll give this game another go <laughs> and so I've actually been playing that a lot the last couple weeks and unlike the first time I played through this time because you can create your own character I'm playing as a Saiyan which is an alien race that the main characters in Dragon Ball um descend from and Mm -hmm. so i'm playing as a saiyan and not only is it a lot more fun i did something different that i didn't do the first time i'm actually looking at my map in game and i'm going to the story quest markers and so now i actually know where i'm going (laughs) 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 and so it's actually become like a like a lot of fun um right now i'm stuck in a place i i 
did low-key rage quit a couple days ago because I keep trying to do this one mission and my character isn't powerful enough to overcome the enemies in that fighting mission. So I keep doing side quests to get my level up. And every time I level up, I do just, a, I get a little bit further, but I still die. And so right now I'm, I'm on pause for that game. Um, but I've been playing that a lot lately and it's been really fun and fulfilling. So shout out to Xenoverse 2. Sorry for what I said last time. <laughs> the other game I've also been playing a lot <laughs> lately is Super Smash Bros. So shout out to Ryan because they came over to my house like I think like a week ago and because I was like, okay, I really want to play Smash Bros specifically to unlock characters because I just had the original roster. And so we were playing through Smash Bros for a while. And you know how when you play Smash Bros like with more than one player, like it'll be like a new enemy appears and then you have to fight them and then you win. Mm -hmm. We kept yeah. losing those. <laughs> so we kept getting oh, all no. these like new characters popping up <laughs> and then we'd keep losing. And so <laughs> my roster didn't really grow that much, but it was a lot of fun. <laughs> I I don't think the Smash Bros. single player campaign is that fun. Has anybody played that or mm -hmm. tried playing it? Yeah. Is this are, Ultimate or? Uh, yeah, the one for the Switch. Oh, yeah. 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 What do y'all think about that? Because I rage quit on that too. I guess I just mm -hmm. don't have patience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Kirby survives the apocalypse, so that is points in my book, but. <laughs> I've been winning with Kirby, and I never played with Kirby before the main campaign, <sighs> but Kirby's just so like Snowball invincible. Kir Snowball Kirby has always been my main. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, like I, I have a really hard time playing through story mode as anyone not Kirby. So have y'all played? Yeah. How do you win story mode? Um, You keep fighting. <laughs> 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 you win the battle. <laughs> I, I I don't know. Is there is there an end to the story mode in that? I forget. Like, I know that it keeps coming up with, like, the new challenges and everything. Mm -hmm. And so I, I know I played through a ton of that mm -hmm. for a uh, single-player game. So I don't know if I ever reached an official okay. end to it. Mm -hmm. Um, cause it's been a while whenever that game came out two or three years ago. Um, and, uh, I, I remember liking it, but like, it does get boring after a while mm. to me. Like I, I like the variety in the matches, but to me, what is it? Is it melee that had the subspace emissary? That was brawl. Was it brawl? Brawl, brawl was yeah. Pound that okay. Was... So th to me, that's still yeah. the like. That is high water mark. Is so good. That is mm -hmm. peak Super Smash Bros. story. Yeah, and um, and yeah, so it's not as good as that, you know. Yeah. Obviously, it, it doesn't do anything as engaging as that. But like, it's fun, particularly if you're by yourself, right? Is like, if you, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's. It's fun to like try out different characters and to That's like true. kind of experiment yeah. with it in yeah. a way that I wouldn't playing with other people because mm -hmm. I would just be so terrible and it wouldn't be a whole lot of fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I'm just not with a whole bunch of people to play that game on a regular basis. So when I am, I'm like, I want to be good at it. I want to like actually be able to play and compete and not just mm -hmm. immediately get myself killed because I'm playing with a character I've never tried before. And yeah. so I feel like the single player gives you the opportunity to try out some of those characters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That I, was my experience, at least. I don't know. OJ, well, you played a little. Yeah, I hate being forced to play a character that I don't want to play. Same. And especially if there's a challenge with them or something, and then I just get stuck on it, and I'm like, oh, I'll just I'll just go back to two-player. Right. So, uh, yeah, that, that's really – I did, like you, I don't know if I actually finished it, but I made it through a lot of it. I think I unlocked everything uh, that you can through that. But it was just like tedious, yeah. Especially having tedious. to play just all the different characters. Like, like give me a little dabble, but make it easy with the other characters, and then let me pick something if I need to do a challenge. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think it's meant to be played straight through. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's yeah. much more of a single player yeah. game <laughs> that you're supposed to like pick up once a week and mm -hmm. play yeah. a mm -hmm. few matches and then come back to. Yeah. Uh, I think that's really the design for that. Or like, even do, I remember my sister and I rented Brawl from Blockbuster back in the day. <laughs> and like we played the story mode on that. And, you know, that was at a time when, okay, you get 30 minutes and then you have to switch, you have to take turns playing on the game systems. Mm -hmm. So we just, that was how we played through story mode was we switched off every 30 minutes. Right. And, that I think helped a lot with the tedium. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, but that's a very different story mode. I'll say, that, but like, <laughs> this yeah. one's much more this tedious one. than the subspace emissary mode. 
Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I've been playing lately, but I, I still maintain Smash Bros. is, like, legit the best game to play if you have friends. I have a lot of fun playing it when I'm not alone. Like, it's a really yeah. good friend game. And it's also, t- it, what I like about it, too, is that it is fun, but you can be as engaged as you want. You can also just mm-hmm. have, like, side conversations or, mm-hmm. like, as you're playing. So, yeah, I yeah. love Smash Bros. Yeah, I think that's actually the way to play that game. Mm-hmm. Like, I think, <laughs> not to offend anyone, I think the people who take Super Smash Brothers really seriously as, like, a competitive game are kind of weird about it. <laughs> <laughs> like, I think that's a party game. Yeah. Yes, yeah. It's yeah. meant to be played as a party game in the same way that you'd play Mario Party. If you're taking it much more seriously than that, I, I think you're missing the fun of the game. <laughs> I agree. Although it's really interesting because I went on IGN. I guess that there's like a lot of thought into strategy playing as different characters. Like characters have different weights and yeah. they, and their weight affects their speed. And then maybe they ha- are better at like A attacks but not B attacks. Mm-hmm. Um, so I the amount of detail into like designing who, like everybody's mm-hmm. abilities is really mind boggling. Because my favorites are um, Ganondorf and Captain Falcon, but they basically have the same move set. But Ganondorf's like way like tankier mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so i enjoy playing as him because captain falcon moves too fast for me i have bad mm-hmm. eyesight yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mood. Mm-hmm. yeah no i mean you know there are people who play that game professionally mm-hmm. yeah i you feel know. like you need to play it with people who are like like if if you're playing it as a party game cool but you need to be playing it with other people who are playing it as a party game. Mm-hmm. Whereas yeah. if you're playing it really seriously you need to be playing it with people who are playing it really yeah. seriously mm-hmm. It's the sort of game that one person can screw up the entire <laughs> the yeah. entire night, right? Yeah. So <laughs> if, if you're the one person who wants to play it super seriously mm-hmm. and everyone else is playing it as a party game, you're going to be miserable. You're the jerk. <laughs> and you're going to make everyone else miserable. Yeah. Yeah. In the same way, like there are there's like a Super Smash Brothers club on campus. Oh. Mm-hmm. And I think they play it super competitively. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I would never want to go to that because I would ruin it for them. Because yeah. I would be over there just, you know, mm-hmm. having Pikachu draw lightning down on himself over and over again. <laughs> and people Pikachu, would hate me. Pikachu, Pikachu, <laughs> And so, you know, like, yeah, I think it's one of those games that you have to be playing with the right sort of, mm-hmm. you know, um, the right sort of group who have the same sort of intentions yeah. with it. Yeah. I mm-hmm. mean, there are people who... There are people you can get around who takes the Jackbox games super seriously. <laughs> yeah. And a- anytime I'm around people like that, I'm like, okay, calm down. <laughs> this is a game designed to be played half drunk. Like, please stop yeah. taking this game so seriously. Yeah. yeah, I think that's just good advice for life. Like, if there's one person super competitive, you're just going to ruin it for everybody else. Just chill, bro. Just chill. Yeah. As a competitive person, this makes me sad. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it just reminds me of, like, in college, like, we we used to play pickup basketball games. Mm. And, you know, you would go out and play basketball and just be kind of having fun. And you'd have that one person that somebody bumped them, and they're like, that's a foul. I get free for the throws. Like, wow. this is a foul. Like, <laughs> you can't foul me. And you're like, man, it, like, we are playing pickup basketball. <laughs> you need to calm down. You're and, being too loud. <laughs> you need to stop taking this all so seriously. <laughs> oh, man. Um, all right. Uh, anything else? Uh, Carly? Nope, nope. That that was that's all I've been playing lately. But I my goal is the next time I'm on the podcast to expand my gaming repertoire because <laughs> I always circle back to the same Switch games. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, have you have you heard everything for me is Pokemon Kirby? <laughs> that's true. Yeah, I do want to try the Kirby games. Maybe I'll have opinions on that next time. Hey, have you heard the good news about Sonic? No. Our, our hedgehog and savior. <laughs> <laughs> Alicia oh can tell God. you all about it. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, now you're getting into some 06 level of cringe. <laughs> <laughs> um, OJ, what have you been playing? Right. So speaking of not expanding a repertoire, uh, <laughs> so I, I essentially finished Vampire Survivors. I've unlocked everything and I've gotten all the secrets. Even the new stuff they just put in this last week? Did they put it on the mobile version this week? Um, yeah, I think it is in the mobile oh, well, version. Okay, well, I need to open it up then. <laughs> <laughs> <Lies>. <laughs> okay, so, but yeah, uh, so I finished all the original, I should say, um, things. And I was getting to a point uh, where any level that I go through, 
uh, as towards the end of it, it was like lagging my phone because it was just so much happening on the screens. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, I, I felt good finally getting all the secrets, even though I, I had to look a couple of them up and I had to cheat through a couple of them. Um, just because, well, one of them you can't do on the phone. Um, so it was, uh, uh, because it, like it, for some reason the coffins don't show up again on the phone mm. or if they do, it's super, super rare. So finding one for the second time, um, you can't you're talking it. about like the, the secrets, the yeah. things actually like that mm. are hitting characters and that yeah. sort of stuff. Yeah. 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 That stuff is, yeah. You do have to look up a lot mm-hmm. of that stuff. Yeah. Um, but uh, otherwise, I, I had fun, and then so if there's new stuff, I, I guess I'll find that out tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, so I've been playing through Final Fantasy XIV um, some more, and uh, so I'm leveling characters. And as I was going through, I was never at like the end content before. So through all of the expansions, I kind of skipped a lot of the end content raids and dungeons. So I'm working on uh, doing the quest to open all of those up and um, go through some. Because as I'm doing, like, my, there's a daily roulette, and, like, one of them is, like, uh, story dungeons. One of them is leveling dungeons. One of them is, like, main scenario quests. uh, And one of them is alliance raids. And I only had the original content alliance raids open. So every time I do it, I'm doing the same three things where there's a whole lot of other ones to do. Um, And then there's alliance raids are, like, there's three parties of 15. Um, and then, oh wait, no, not 15. But there's three three large parties that come together. And then there's normal raids, which is like just two groups of people that are coming together to do it. And I only have one set of those unlocked too. Um, so I'm always fighting Alexander over and over again. Uh, so now I'm trying to open those up so I can have a little bit more uh, flavor in my roulettes, I guess. <laughs> Uh, and have more stuff open for different level categories. Um, and so I leveled uh, a Summoner, which is my the main one that I wanted to do. Then I did Gunbreaker, Black Mage, Reaper, Dancer, and I'm currently working on Red Mage, which are, is really interesting. Are, are these character classes or reindeer? <laughs> <laughs> a little of both. A little of both, okay. I think. I do have a reindeer mount, though. Oh, okay. That, uh, so for the Christmas event. I was event, wondering if you had that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, Justin the, said that. The, the Christmas so event. So I wasn't wrong. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, the Christmas event, you get a reindeer mount, and then it has a little action that you do, and he does like a, a little uh, kind of like fireworks, but it has presents and um, like other Christmassy type stuff. It's really, it's really neat. So I just ran it. I also have a flying pig. It's called a porksy. Um, and so it's a, it's like a, a pig and it flies with its uh, ears, Ooh. right? And the so in the game, the porksies, um, or at least the ones that you deal with a lot, they suck out people's dreams. And the, the, the main character, porksy, that was in the storyline um, was sucking out nightmares of oh. people. And then you would fight the nightmares and save people from these nightmares and stuff like that. Um, so I have a flying pig, I have a reindeer, um, <laughs> I have a mechanical hand, which is pretty awesome. Think, think of like the hands in Zelda that would come through the wall and just grab you. Oh yeah. Um, so there's Nightmare a magi- inducing. Yeah. There's a Magitek version of those. Where's, where's a pork seed to help That's with it. that? Right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so it's kind of funny cause the hand just grabs you and is like pulling you around and you're just like <laughs> hanging there limp as it pulls you around at the mount. Um, there's some really awesome mounts in there. Um, my partner it does like end game content and has some really, really, really awesome mounts. Like one is like a really big fire dragon. It's a really long fire dragon. Um, he has the car from a Final Fantasy for or uh, fifteen, um, which plays the music from it. Um, some really, really fantastic mounts. Um, and I so I uh, the the way that the story is set up is when they did one point oh which was just a horrible, horrible game. Oh, my gosh, yeah. That was... <laughs> You're talking about pre-Realm Reborn. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the, what the storyline led up to is that um, essentially the Empire was working to bring down a big red moon called Delmud, which was housing Bahamut, which uh, a former, like the Elegans, which were like a really high... like forward technology civilization that kind of died out. Um, they captured the Bahamut primal in this moon. 
And then they were um, essentially torturing a bunch of dragons in the moon because in the game, the way that you bring the primals out, like which are mo- mostly what we think of as summons, um, is that some race of creatures has to be have a really like big emotional attachment and they need the primal and then a bunch of they need a bunch of crystals and then they make the primal out of like their their faith right and so there a bunch of dragons are being tortured in this moon for like thousands of years so that their faith would sustain bahamut and then bahamut would like create energy for this moon who's being captured there right so the the end end content of or the end of 1.0 was this moon, them bringing it down like Meteor, and then uh, Bahamut coming out. And the very last scene before they close the servers down on 1.0 was the main, like, prota- or one of your main protagonists, uh, Archon Louis Swa. Everybody's fighting in the Cartno Flats. And then you see this big giant moon coming down, and you see Bahamut come out. And they try, they're trying to summon the 12 which is one of the, like, it, it's it, it's actually a primal, but it's one that, like, the people of the, like, the main characters that you play kind of uh, believes in, right? And so they're summoning the 12 to try and encapsulate Bahamut again, and he breaks out of it. And then Archon Louis ends up uh, creating, like, this big, like, barrier for everybody and teleports everyone out. And then he's trying to stop it, and you can tell he's just about to die. Mm-hmm. And Bahamut comes to destroy him, and then that's where 1.0 ended. Mm. When a, in A Realm Reborn, you're dealing with the world after this big tragedy where the moon exploded and it changed everything, um, and Bahamut and Louis Swa are dead, as far as you know. Well, Bahamut's missing, but people don't know what's happening. But the end, end game of that, before the first ex- big expansion came out, was you find out that Bahamut was being reconstructed by the moon, the pieces of the moon that were under the ground. Um, and then you find out that Louis Swa was actually being reconstructed too. And then as a summoner, you sum, you, the, you have two big summons that you pull out. One is Demi Bahamut and the other is Demi Phoenix. And so I finally fought and beat them while well, I've been summoning them for a long time, but I finally <laughs> fought and beat them. <laughs> and, and so now I know where that comes from. Because the other summons that you can do is like Garuda, which is wind, um, Ifrit, which is fire, and Titan, which is earth, right? Um, and so, like, I you had to fight those in the storyline, but Bahamut and Phoenix were in this like extra raid stuff. But also, it used to be the hardest content in the game, but I'm max level now, and so I'm just going through by myself and hitting three buttons and everything dies. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so. So that's kind of fun going through and seeing the story of everything that's happening and stuff that I missed that would have made other things make sense because I didn't go through right. with that. Yeah. Um, I, w- so. I will say you talking about this, it it, it just like spirals. Like it starts yeah. <laughs> yeah. It starts off and you're like, uh-huh, uh-huh, okay, so there's a dragon on the moon. Yeah. And, and then, but the dragon goes back in time. Yeah. <laughs> And, right. but oh, Final Fantasy, convoluted yeah. storytelling all the yeah. way. <laughs> well, that was my reaction because I was sitting there listening going, this is the goofiest. No, this is the most Final Fantasy story possible. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like this is every Final Fantasy mm-hmm. starts off like fairly grounded and normal. And mm-hmm. then by the end, like, yeah. you know, you're trying to, you're trying to kill and dethrone God. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the story. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, or or emotions like Princess Peach is the <laughs> <laughs> the end boss, right? right. Um, so yeah, that's that's just what most of what I've been playing. I've I've been I had a lot of other stuff, so I haven't been able to play much new. Uh, I did though want to bring up again the the Bayonetta um, thing that was a Nintendo Direct because I watched the video. Yeah, this is the Bayonetta Origins yeah. Yeah. game, um, and I am very uncomfortable with it. <laughs> Because she has, uh, she's still, she's 12 years old. Yeah. And she has thigh high socks and a very, very, very short dress. Like if she, if she kicks, you're going to see things you probably shouldn't be seeing from a 12 year old. That's great. Right? Well, I'm sure they're not going to actually show it in right. the game. But, right. uh, but you know, yeah, there's fan wearing, art. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, I expected. hate that. I hate that that's right. a fact, but you right. know that it is. Yes. Yeah. And, 
So I Deviant art exists for a reason. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that reason is not good, but it exists. it's a reason. Um, yeah, and so I I think she's much more sexualized than I would want her to be. But Bayonetta has to be sexualized to be Bayonetta. And you're finding, like, her origin of how she's becoming a witch. And another thing that I don't like watching it is that the, the, the purpose of it is she can hold things down while this other demon kills it, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, her power is being taken away from her actually being able to do damage. All she can do is, like, be a support and hold something there while this demon beats it up. Right. Yeah. Um, Cheshire. Yeah, Cheshire. So learning, like, it, it's supposed to be her learning to be a witch, but from just from this preview, it looks like she's not doing much except for holding them. She's not learning how to fight or attack or anything like that. And when I'm playing Bayonetta, I want to see a big hair boot kick something and just destroy it, right? Or a big hair fist just to come and knock someone. And I, I don't want to just see her, oh, look, I'm holding people while I'm wearing my thigh-high socks and the short skirt, right? Um, That's creepy. Yeah, so I'm. Uh, I'll probably play it just because it's big in that game. But uh, I'm. I am uncomfortable with how sexualized they made her at twelve. Yeah. Yeah, and I. I think that's always the complication with something like that, right? Mm-hmm. Like if you strip all the sexualization out of Bayonetta, is Bayonetta still the same character? Because mm-hmm. that's such an instrumental part to that right. character, the look mm-hmm. and design of the character, yeah. right? And her owning that sexuality too. Yeah. 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 Um, and uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, I don't know. Like, and I don't know how you do a, a prequel game to that, mm-hmm. right? Like, do right. you, do you depict her mm-hmm. sort of coming to terms with her sexuality? Is, right. is that part of the game? Mm-hmm. Uh, Cause that shouldn't be part of this game. Right. From right. the way that they're showing right. it. Right. Right. I mean, everyone's always, you know, has a conceptualization and is working with their sexuality throughout their entire life. But a video game about a 12 year old <laughs> and it, falling into like a Lolita stereotype yeah. Yeah. is not what it can, we it can go. It can, it can get ugly really yeah. fast. <laughs> yeah. Um, and like, so maybe if it's, if it's 18 Bayonetta, I can see it be like having a lot more relation to Bayonetta as a yeah. game, but, but 12 year old Bayonetta, I'm, I'm just not comfortable with. Yeah, I've never played a Bayonetta game. Like, most uh-huh. of what I know about it is from <laughs> you talking about it. Yeah. But watch, watching that, I was definitely like, this doesn't, this feels like it was made as an original thing. And then uh-huh. they were like, Bayonetta. <laughs> I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think as far as like a prequel, it, it kind of makes me think of uh, the Tomb Raider reboot mm-hmm. that they did a few years back, um, mm-hmm. where. That game is about how Lara Croft becomes Lara Croft, mm-hmm. right? right? And so she is very much not this, like, hardened, tough mm-hmm. character at the beginning. And a lot of people kind of criticize that game, and they're like, you know, oh, she's she's upset about killing somebody, and she's, like, you know, scared. And, like, you're – and I was like, but they're trying to humanize her at the beginning, and then mm-hmm. by the end of that game – isn't you know what is that game 15 years old now yeah. I, I don't want to spoil it but like there is that moment in that game where you become the tomb raider yeah mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. you're like okay so like this has all been very well planned out mm-hmm. to get us to this final moment and now you are the character you were playing in all those old mm-hmm. games mm-hmm. um and I, I thought they handled that very well in that game there there's problems with that game but like mm-hmm. overall i thought they handled that very well um they're there just aren't the same hints that they are handling it well with Bayonetta yeah. from <laughs> at least the trailers that we've mm-hmm. seen so far. Right. Yeah. That'll be interesting to see. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, anything else? Um, that's it for me. Okay. Um, I also did not play a whole lot new. I did. I did so I did go back and play some new vampire survivors. because they, <laughs> they did put a little bit new into that game. Um, including a, what is it, is it called like backcountry or something stage in there, which gets really weird and trippy. Um, so that game's still cool, and it's still cool that they're putting out, you know, basically free updates even after they put out DLC for it. Um, I did play some more uh, Metroid Prime Remastered, and I, I kind of just wanted to talk about, like, this is a really, really good remaster of Metroid Prime. And Metroid Prime, I think, 
I talked about it in regards to um, GoldenEye 007 because I mm. played that very recently as well. And that GoldenEye doesn't hold up super well, but this game does hold up super well. And I think it's a really good example of how to do a remaster and why a remaster matters. Like if you go back, this game sort of predates um, the standardization of first person controls on game consoles. So it's about the same time as Halo. It predates the Call of Duty 4 and that sort of standardization of first-person controls in video games. Um, And to go back at it and try to play that game on GameCube now, I think the game probably still holds up super well, but I think it would be extremely challenging. And I think this shows why uh, video games getting remastered and people going back and approaching them from a new perspective, from a more modern perspective and saying, okay, how would people play this game today? How would they want to interact with this game today? Um, Just shows the need for this industry, right? Mm -hmm. Like we don't need you to change a new hope, George Lucas. (laughs) Um, But Right, like because that's a, that's a passive activity, and we engage with Star Wars the same way today as we did forty years ago. Mm-hmm. The only difference is we might be watching it on a mobile phone versus you know in a theater. Mm-hmm. But with video games, we don't interact with them the same, and we don't come in with the same expectations for video games. And so there almost has to be those sort of changes, those updates, that sort of evolution of classic games so that people can understand and play these games today. So, you know, I tried it. Um, I was uh, watching somebody play some uh, Pitfall 2, and Pitfall 2 is sort of the the prototype for metroidvanias so Mm -hmm. metroid and you know lots of other games basically are borrowing this sort of open environment much more than the original uh pitfall is Mm -hmm. but like when you go back and you look at that game now there's no map in that game and there's no like clear oh i can do this and fall this distance and not get hurt and everything that game would be extremely challenging for Mm -hmm. somebody who was born in the last 20 years to go back and play that game now Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right and I feel like Metroid Prime was getting to that point where if I took my nephew and sat him down in front of that game, he might be like, why is this game so awkward in the way I have to play it? And this remaster gets rid of a lot of that, and it does it through updating the controls, certainly. But it also does it through, you know, even... Um, even some of the things in the menus and the like streamlining of that. And it's an interesting experience to go back and play a game like this and see that, Oh, they've really made this game entirely accessible today. Mm -hmm. Um, And in a way that people can go and play this game and go, Oh, this is an amazing game. And I understand why people still talk about this game some 20 years later. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I thought that was neat. And also, I just think it's an amazing game still. You know, I I talked about how I feel like after playing that game, I thought, oh, every game will be like this. And they're not. Mm -hmm. And going back and playing it, you go, oh, no. Like, most people didn't learn the lesson of this game, which Mm -hmm. is to create this atmosphere. And, you know, the kind of joy of a Metroid game was always, even dating back to the original NES Metroid, was you are alone in this strange world and you feel extremely vulnerable Mm -hmm. uh, starting out and you gain power ups and new abilities. And by the end you feel like a a total badass. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Which is cool when you find out that Samus is a woman. Mm -hmm. Right. And certainly you don't know that in the original, this one, you know, pretty early on Samus is a woman, Mm -hmm. but like in that original game, you don't know that. And so it is the, you know, sort of, higher fantasy that lots of video games give you. Um, But in, you know, in this one, they really did an amazing job of taking that and translating it into a 3d world. So the original Metroid super Metroid did that very well in 2d. They took that 
gameplay style and format and said, okay, how do we translate this into 3D? How do we still make you feel like you're alone in this world that feels mostly abandoned other than enemies? But, you know, there's no, like, towns or villages that you're visiting or anything of that nature. Um, And it feels a little creepy at times, and you feel vulnerable very early on. And they do that really well with the first time there's a flash and you see Samus's reflection in your helmet Mm -hmm. and all that. Um, it's just like an amazing achievement and playing through it. I I just think about Nintendo did that so well. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, when you think about, they took Mario and translated that into Mario 64, which to this day maybe is the one that holds up the least, but like, it's still this amazing, Mm -hmm. you know, platformer game and every plat 3d platformer still copies from that to Mm -hmm. this day. Yeah. And then they did it with Zelda. And basically every adventure game is still copying Zelda mm-hmm. to this day. And then they did it with Metroid. And, you know, and their first time out translating Metroid to a 3D game, they just knock it out of the park with this game that is still, in my mind, one of the best video games ever made. And people still haven't been able to copy it. You know, like I know we've talked about this before with uh, 3D platformers most people still can't make a 3D platformer as good as Nintendo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. You know, even when they make something like Kirby and the Forgotten Land, you play that game and you go, this is so much better than all the knockoffs that are trying to do this. (laughs) And I don't even think Kirby and the Forgotten Land is as good as the Mario games, Mm -hmm. but it's still like heads above pretty much every other 3D Mm -hmm. platformer. And so I just come away replaying this game going, God, this is a great game. And like, they were so much ahead of the game and still are with things like this. And, um, you know, it, it's the sort of game that when you play it, you, I remember playing it the first time and just, I was like giddy excited playing it. Like this is an amazing experience. You know, the first time you saw like your favorite movie, how excited it made you. That was my feeling playing this game the first time. And, uh, the fact that it can still engender that sort of response, you know, decades later and many, many games later uh, is a real testament to the quality of, uh, of Metroid Prime. And so, yeah, that's my uh, rant about why Metroid Prime is a great <laughs> video game. I want to play that game now, though. Yeah, if, if you haven't played Metroid Prime, uh, this is obviously the way to play it. And I think it's a game that, very much with this remaster holds up in 2023. Like, I think it's still, if this game came out today, brand new at the end of the year, this would be on everybody's top 10 list. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's just that, you know, that need of a game. Um, All right. That does it for what we've been playing. So let's move on to news. And um, let's start off with Echoes of Mana is ending service on May 15th. Um, This was a live service uh, game built around the Mana franchise and everything. Um, I don't know that, did anyone actually play this? I had no idea it existed until OJ sent us the article about it shutting down <laughs> yeah i think i think we're the problem <laughs> that's why this game is shutting down none of us actually played it mm-hmm. um i but, liked the mana games but i never i knew this existed but i didn't download it and play it yeah well and i think that's the problem with a lot of these live service games and so i, I kind of threw in this other story alongside that uh multiverses this is the warner brothers uh uh, Super Smash Brothers like with all the Warner Brothers characters, including LeBron James, <laughs> my favorite Warner Brothers character. <laughs> um, it has seen a 99% drop um, in its peak players since launch. So its peak player was, I think, believe back in March of last year, right after it launched. And it has seen a 99% decline since then. Um and, of course, we talked about this game last summer after this game had come out. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, I played it. I think Ryan played a little bit of mm-hmm. it. Um, and it's a pretty is a pretty good game. 
and people seemed really into it and there was a lot of talk about it and that has seems to have just evaporated. Mm -hmm. Who are the other characters in this game? Uh, well, Velma could call the cops on people. <laughs> yeah. Wait, really? Yeah. yeah. That got changed. The essay. <laughs> yeah. So it she changed to the mystery machine. Um, yeah. So she would call the cops, and the police would come and grab someone and throw them in the cop car and beat them up and then drive off a cliff. And it w like the big thing that was showing is like they would have LeBron James, and then you know Vel this white woman's calling the yeah. cops on the black man. He gets beat up, thrown in a cop car, and drove, driven off a cliff. Yeah. So then they changed it to the mystery machine, which wasn't necessarily better. Yeah. But she called them, and then they they beat him up and threw him in a van. And, now it's and a group of teenagers and their dog beating up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, but it, it has um, so it has, has like the, the Looney Tunes characters. It has mm -hmm. some of the Hanna Barbera characters, uh, like Scooby Doo. It has the DC superheroes. Yeah, it has like what? Superman and Batman, Wonder Woman. It has Kevin Conroy voicing Batman. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Nice. It has um, it has some of the Game of Thrones characters. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. basically anything that Warner Brothers owns. So <laughs> any of their also have like Steven Universe. And yeah. Yeah. What system is this on? It's on Steam. Well, it's on, it's on PC. It's on consoles as well. I don't think it's on Switch, maybe, but it's on PlayStation and Xbox. Oh. oh. I can play this on Steam, though. Having Game of Thrones characters fighting, mm -hmm. like, Batman. Oh, yeah. my God. That's so cool. Arya Stark just kicking Batman's ass. Yeah. yeah. So, like, and that was the cool of it. Yeah. And it's, you know... It doesn't wow. play exactly the same as Super Smash Bros., but it's very much in that style yeah. of Super Smash Brothers. Um, and it's a good game, but, you know, I, I just kind of lost interest and went on to new games. But, like, I think it's kind of the problem with a lot of these live service games, and we've talked the past couple of weeks about multiple live service games shutting, shutting down. It is extremely difficult to keep one of these games going. Yeah, yeah. And if something like Multiverses, which has every major property that you can imagine, you know, DC Comics and Scooby Doo and, uh, you know, LeBron James. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the most you famous athlete in the world, <laughs> potentially. Um, if that can't make it, right? Like, that's, we understand why a game like Rumbleverse, the, the wrestling themed uh, Battle Royale, like, you know, they announced, what was it, a week or two ago that they were shutting that down. Well, you kind of understand when that game mm -hmm. can't make it if Multiverses is suffering a 99% mm -hmm. drop yeah. in its players. Because it's even more accessible and it has characters that everyone knows. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not wholly original material, right? Wow. Um, so I, that... Multiverses is not announcing it's shutting down or anything. I, I think they did announce that they're uh, delaying the next season of content, but apparently even that's been kind of underwhelming uh, for people. Um, but, yeah, it's it's not a good time to be a live service game unless your name is Fortnite. And I, <laughs> I don't even yeah. know with Fortnite at this point. Like, mm -hmm. I kind of wonder what their player base looks like. Yeah, I feel like I used to hear about Fortnite in the media all the time mm -hmm. and hear people talk about it. I don't think I've heard people really mention Fortnite casually like in a really long time. Mm -hmm. I feel like the the most I hear of Fortnite is people like bringing it up ironically. Yeah. Like I don't hear mm -hmm. of anyone actually <laughs> playing it. Like it's almost like a meme. I'm playing that fork knife. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the the oh poor waitresses God. who are hearing that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Um yeah, like, and I don't know. So we talk a lot about the biggest games in the world are games that none of us play or ever talk about. Mm -hmm. So it's it's Minecraft, it's Roblox, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Like, I, I feel like I still hear people. You know, I I still know people who play Minecraft and who mm -hmm. play Roblox. Yeah, like, even though I don't, I see a lot of mm -hmm. people playing it on Twitch and on YouTube and mm -hmm. all that. I don't ever see anyone playing Fortnite. But see, I don't know if Fortnite is is like that. Because, yeah. like, I, I mm -hmm. never hear anybody talk about Roblox. Minecraft, yes. Um, but Roblox is, as far as I know, bigger than Minecraft. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was at least at one point the biggest game out there. Mm -hmm. And I'm just not traveling in those circles, yeah. <laughs> no. right? Because mm -hmm. I think it's a lot of eight-year-old kids. And mm -hmm. other than my nieces and nephews, like, I'm not around eight-year-old kids an awful lot. Yeah. <laughs> so... I don't know. I don't know if Fortnite is like that, mm -hmm. you know. 
I feel like I wouldn't know until I get a statistic like this that they've lost 99% of yeah. their fan base. <laughs> yeah. Or if Lil Nas X is involved. Because Lil Nas X did a, a, a concert on Roblox. Mm-hmm. Oh. Lil Nas X did the oh, uh, did the song for um, League of Legends, the 2022 thing, mm-hmm. the Star Walker song, which I've been listening to a lot lately, which is what made me think of it. Um, and so follow Lil Nas X to see if something is going to fail or not. Because <laughs> as far as I know, he hasn't done anything with Fortnite. He may have. Didn't he do a concert? You know what? Actually, I think he did. Now that, yeah, well, I could have sworn that, I that he it. was Hold like on. an in-game skin. Or Fortnite, but that okay. could also just be my imagination. Probably because they've done in game skins yeah. just yeah. about everything in that game. <laughs> Even I'm in like. there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really, I didn't know that. <laughs> to pick up that skin. <laughs> yeah, and there's a Lil Nas X uh, skin, and um, I may be misremembering. I know there were several yeah. concerts that they put on live in Fortnite. I feel like the Fortnite skins of, like, real people never look like the actual people. Like, even, like, the Tom Holland Spider-Man one, like, I'm like, I guess I could buy that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, they have to they have to change all of them to fit that style. Yeah. The style of mm-hmm. Fortnite. And so, you know, it, it works easier with Batman or Superman because you can just, they already are cartoony in yeah. some incarnations. But, like, when you try to get a real person into that, Right, like when you're like, look, is is Orlando Bloom, and you're like, <laughs> Orlando Bloom is already kind of featureless. <laughs> oh. So, so I I just looked it up from my cursory examination. Uh-huh. It looks like Lil Nas X did uh, Roblox, Travis Scott did Fortnite, and Lil Nas X did much better on Roblox than Travis Scott did on Fortnite. Uh-huh. That's where where it was coming from, I think. Okay. All right. But well, he does have a Fortnite skin, you said. Yeah. 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 Well, there is our weekly uh, Fortnite update. Yeah. <laughs> we are foremost Fortnite authorities. From, <laughs> from 2021. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you know, that those games are probably still going fairly well. Yeah. But, you know, I, I think they're more, very much proving that they are the exception, that you can't simply mm-hmm. copy that and try to mm-hmm. replicate it. Yeah. I think saturation as well. Um, For sure. Because it, it's not, you know, 1998 where we get one good fighting game every four or five years. Mm-hmm. We have so much of this coming out at once that, like, I can't play all of them. Mm-hmm. So I will either go right. back to what I know or I will hit jump on the next big thing to try and find something to match what I know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think Carly talking about Super Smash Brothers earlier – I own Super Smash Brothers Ultimate. Mm-hmm. I have not picked it up and played it in quite a while. Um, playing for Pets, definitely. I don't know if yep. I've played it since at Playing for Pets. Mm-hmm. Um, but, right, like, that's fine because they already have my $60 or whatever I right. paid for that game when it mm-hmm. came out. Versus, uh, multiverses, for that game to succeed and to work, they need me playing that game every day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Right. Fortnite the same way, and I don't have, I don't have the time, mm-hmm. but I also don't want to make that commitment to one game. Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe I want to make it to just one game, right? Like, yeah. so you can play Final Fantasy fourteen, but you can't have four or five Final mm-hmm. Fantasy fourteens, right? That you're playing at once, right? Right. And that was what happened to MMOs. Mm-hmm. It, you yeah. know, everybody tried to launch an MMO, and people realized, oh wait, you can have World of Warcraft and one or two others. Yeah. And we're seeing that with live service games that you can have Fortnite and one or two others, but everyone can't have one because mm-hmm, right. people just don't have the time mm-hmm. yeah, or the interest. <laughs> Even super amazing ones like uh, Anarchy Online was really fantastic. I think it's actually still going as free to play, but um, like it was amazing, but it couldn't compete with EverQuest and World of Warcraft and Final Fantasy 11. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, but it was an it's it's an amazing game. Oh sure, yeah. I mean mm-hmm. I, I think some of these live service games, mm-hmm. right? I, I think Multiverses is a cool game. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Rumbleverse is a cool game. Mm-hmm. I didn't play Echoes of Mana, but it looked <laughs> neat from yeah. what I saw of it. But now I'll never know. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Um, let's see. Speaking of Final Fantasy, uh, there is a story going around that Final Fantasy Tactics Remaster is probably on the way. This comes from one of the developers who apparently just kind of casually dropped in and said, mm-hmm. yeah, that's probably going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so that's kind of neat. They've put out Final Fantasy Tactics, uh, re-released it times before, but it is at a point where they probably need to do a more thorough yeah. remaster of that game. Because, and and here's the thing is I, it's a fantastic game. It's a fantastic story. I won't play it right now. Um, I won't go back and play it because it's so slow. Um, mm. it, it, it takes forever to get through a round, mm-hmm. right? And so it, it needs to be sped up a lot. That's what I'm looking for in a remaster is have, let it be sped up a lot. Yeah, and when the standard today for those sorts of tactic strategy games mm-hmm. is the Fire Emblem games, yeah. like that's what people are going to be coming to that mm-hmm. game expecting, that yeah. sort of more snappy, fast-paced mm-hmm. you know, tactics yeah. uh, gameplay. So is this one similar to like Civ where you take civilization or like you take turns? Just takes a long time. Oh, uh, it's like Civ. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, kind of. It's 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 turn based, um, with a lot like the the terrain matters, but not necessarily as much as Civ. Gosh, yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, think of it like a a, a turn based role playing game, except you are spending a whole lot of time positioning your characters around a three D map. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. To interact them with each other, so sort of the grid base of Civ, where mm-hmm. you're moving your armies and civilizations around, mm-hmm. but um, more of the gameplay of a Japanese role playing game. Mm-hmm. Okay, so four yeah. Condor in Final Fantasy Seven. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, um, so speaking of Final Fantasy Seven, um, we talked about this a few weeks ago that Pyrowash Simulator is getting free Final Fantasy Seven content, which is still the most insane, amazing thing. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and that's coming out March second, but they did show off for the first time some uh, more images of it. So I guess before they had shown and they'd shown like Cloud's motorcycle would be mm-hmm. in it. This time they've actually shown additional locations and content as part of this. And OJ, I know you were particularly excited about this. Yeah. uh, So they have seventh heaven in there and like the whole place looks dirty. So I'm very, like, I'm really, really, really excited. I was, I was like, you know what? I'll probably get power rush simulator at some point if it goes on sale. Now I'm going to buy this for this content. It's free DLC, but I'm buying the whole thing because of it, because like, this is just going to be, this is amazing. Um, I think, uh, Justin, you were telling me that people playing the Tomb Raider one was talking about all the Easter eggs that are in it, right? Yeah, so mm-hmm. I, I downloaded the Tomb Raider content uh, this morning, actually, because I was looking at this Final Fantasy stuff, and I was like, yeah, they did Tomb Raider stuff. I should play that. I should actually see what that looks like. And so I downloaded that, and it's it's pretty cool. Like, I mean, it's got Croft Manor, like, out, straight out of the games. It's, you can go inside Croft Manor, and they have the T-Rex from the first game. Mm-hmm. Um, in there, and then they have uh, the training course from Tomb Raider 2 where you could, like, run basically an obstacle course that was in her backyard that Lara had built and stuff. And But then there's, like, other little Easter eggs that are included in there, little lines of dialogue and stuff, um, which, you know, some of those I, I, I didn't play through all the content yet, but, like, I wasn't even seeing some of those on my own. Um and so, yeah, I think what I was saying to you earlier was this is not something thrown together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. there's some passion behind this. They are actually putting some effort into it because my concern when they first announced this was, okay, so like Croft Manor is going to just be the exterior of a house and mm-hmm. you have that already in the game. And then when they announced the Final Fantasy stuff and the first image was of uh, Cloud's motorcycle, mm-hmm. I was like, well, that's cool. But, you know, that's hard to get excited about just mm-hmm. his motorcycles in the game. But when they start showing off these images, that's what got me to go check out uh, what they had done with Tomb Raider because I didn't realize they'd put so much. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, when I talked about that game last year, one of the things I noted was there's so much content in that mm-hmm. game. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, that's a game you can literally play for mm-hmm. months. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and the fact that they're adding this much additional content entirely free, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, at $20 or whatever that game is selling for, it's, it's entirely worth it. Mm-hmm. Like, if you think you'll get any value out of that game, because uh, you can just keep playing it forever, mm-hmm. <laughs> just about. Well, and I'm in the same boat as OJ. Like, mm-hmm. I enjoyed you guys talking about it previously, but I was, and I was like, yeah, maybe I'll pick it up at some point. And now I'm like, the fact that... You know, if this was just DLC content, I'd be like, oh, that's cool. Mm-hmm. The fact that it's free DLC, mm-hmm. I'm like, right. I will spend the money to get Power Wash Simulator so I can play this. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, and I told OJ, like, I think maybe part of the strategy behind that is, okay, we're going to put this out free because then we don't ever have to discount the game, mm-hmm. right? So if we're selling the game at, and I, I'm not sure if it's $20, $30, um, it's somewhere in that range, though. I don't think it's any more we don't have to lower the price of the game because we're giving you this extra DLC for free. And so that's the incentive. That's the discount, right? We're giving you this cool new stuff. Yeah. And they've announced it for these two games. Like who knows? Like they may be doing more, Mm -hmm. right? Like, but just off what I saw of the Tomb Raider content, what I've seen of this, like, you know, I'm not going to say this isn't, there's certainly not an entire new game worth of Mm -hmm. content, but they are much more than what I was expecting, which was, look, here's one thing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. And we can say we did something with Tomb Raider. We can say we did something with Final Fantasy. Mm-hmm. It's like, no, they're actually, there's actually care and love put into this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Power Wash Simulator. What a bizarre game. <laughs> <laughs> it's so weird for me because my, my summer job for like five years has been working at a AR North America, which manufactures and sells pressure washers. And so, like, the idea of a, of a, of a power washer video game just, <laughs> I'm like, this is, hang on, <laughs> this is supposed to be work. <laughs> See, and I feel like a company like that should make some sort of co marketing deal. Like, you know, buy a power washer from us, we'll give you a free copy of this game. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, I'll tell them to get on that. <laughs> Um, let's see. Activision Blizzard uh, plans to end all remote work. So if you know employees need it, more of a reason to dislike Activision. <laughs> uh, they just keep twisting that knife. Um, they really, uh, we really need like an Activision air horn. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like a large portion of what people at Activision Blizzard do is going to be on a computer. If we're talking about all the developers, all the, the creators, all the coders. That's all computer stuff that you don't need to be in an office for if you have it at home. So, like, this seems like an industry that would benefit more from having home remote work than, than most other companies. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, not not being in a company and mm-hmm. seeing how it works internally is mm-hmm. it's hard to say. And I know remote work has been challenging, particularly for Japanese developers because they weren't set up for mm-hmm. that when COVID hit. Yep. And I know it, it put a lot of delays in the developments of games, mm-hmm. but I, I think you're right that a lot of game development work seems like work that could be handled, if not full-time remote, at least part-time mm-hmm. remote. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, It's it's not like running a catering business where mm-hmm. you would need to have quite the setup in your home kitchen to be right. able to do that. Mm-hmm. Like a, how many places supplied computers to their employees for remote work. Mm-hmm. Well, and, you like, know, you, there's certainly, I can see like there's hardware that you would need to be in the office for, but mm-hmm. like OJ said, even, even part-time remote work makes a lot more sense for this than certain mm-hmm. other industries out there. Yeah. And I think in an industry where they are very much competing for employees mm-hmm. right now, Yeah, like the big issue is a lot of developers can't hire enough people. And so when you're in a situation like that, removing remote work seems like one more reason somebody's not going to choose to come work for you. And Activision Blizzard particularly has this problem with all their harassment issues and everything. Like they need to be doing everything possible to get people excited to work for them. (laughs) They're like, come in one space so we can harass you easier. (laughs) (laughs) You're not wrong. (laughs) I mean, yeah. I mean, it kind of feels that way, doesn't it? Yeah. Like so we, we can harass you easier without documentation of you know if if somebody says something to you in person, <laughs> or oh email. God. 
Well, and have we actually fixed these issues? Right? I'm not confident they do. No. Uh, no. Just hazarding a guess. But they, yeah. they would need to do some serious PR work mm-hmm. to convince me that they did. <laughs> well, and that was part of the, you know, the plan for Microsoft buying them was that the hope that Microsoft could address some of these, oh. that Microsoft's culture would, you know, alleviate some of these problems. Mm-hmm. Not that Microsoft is themselves entirely clean mm-hmm. and innocent, but the hope was that their culture would get rid of some of the culture that had obviously permeated throughout uh, Activision. And as that deal gets delayed <laughs> and as they start pushing people to come back to work, it just seems like a bad stew. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So video game industry, fix yourselves. Yeah. <laughs> um, speaking of potential problems with the video game industry fixing themselves, this is a wild story. Saudi Arabia has increased their investment in Nintendo for the second time in a month to 7.087%. That was the story I intended to read until just today, like three days after I wrote this story into our list of news to cover this week. Just today they announced they have now upped that ownership stake to 8.26%. So now Saudi Arabia is the second big is the biggest outside holder of Nintendo. Mm. Wow. That that's just bizarre to me. Like why? Saudi Arabia has been trying to diversify mm-hmm. as they see oil eventually mm-hmm. drying up and running out and that's their basically entire economy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so they've been trying to diversify and invest more. They now own something like 96% of SNK. So uh, if you play an SNK game, uh, Saudi Arabia mm-hmm. now pretty much owns that entire company. And so part of this has been, right, buying Nintendo. Um, wow. Not buying Nintendo outright, obviously, right, but buying up a stake in it. They also own stakes in, I believe, Capcom and... Um, um, and some other Japanese uh, developers as well. Part of why this is an issue and part of why this has been a story is, right, we've certainly talked on this podcast about the controversy around Hogwarts Legacy and J.K. Rowling's association with that game. Some people have pointed to this and said, well, you're upset about J.K. Rowling. Are you also going to be upset about Saudi Arabia owning a Uh, a large stake in a video game company. This is a country that, you know, um, murdered an American journalist. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're upset about Rowling's involvement with a video game, are we also upset about this? Mm -hmm. And I don't have a clear, easy answer to that question Mm -hmm. because I think they're both kind of icky. Yeah. More than kind of. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that's just. Yeah, and Saudi Arabia has uh, capital punishment and life in prison for LGBTQ people I would say as well. Saudi yeah. Arabia has some problematic stuff. Yeah. And we should be very clear we're talking about the government here. Yes. Mm-hmm. This is the not yeah. individual people, yeah. right? Um, in the same way, when we talk about Hogwarts Legacy, we're talking about J.K. Rowling behind the game, not the developers mm-hmm. who. Yeah. Yeah. at some yeah. level have to do what they're told. Mm-hmm. Um, don't get to decide which project they're working on. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I, I think it is worth, um, I think it is worth being aware of, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And like I said, I don't have an answer for what people should do. Um, I, I think there is a bit of a distinction here in that we're talking about a company that has an investment and, Companies that are publicly traded, anyone can buy stock in those companies. Mm -hmm. So it's not like Nintendo can stop Saudi Arabia from buying their stock, Mm -hmm. right? Um, Versus where there is one person who is behind a game and attached to it and holds very hurtful and, you know, uh, mean-spirited beliefs. Mm -hmm. Um, So I, I think there is a distinction in that, but I do also think, 
as video games become a much bigger industry, it's something that the people engaging with video games have to consider. Like, who is making the money off of this game? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, who is financing this game? Does this matter to me? Does, you know, do I want to be a conscientious consumer? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, which is not something I ever thought about with video <laughs> games. <laughs> right. Right? Like, I mean, you, you bought a video game because it looked cool. You didn't think about, like, who was pulling the strings behind the scenes mm-hmm. at Capcom. Yeah. Like, you know, all the arguments about violence in video games, you think about that, but then not like, oh, hey, what's what's the violence behind the investors? Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I feel like this is this is like, you know, when I was growing up, you had all the public service ma- announcements about, like, all the terrible labor conditions for people making clothes and now I feel like we're shifting towards that with video games like just sure developing that awareness and it's like like you said not something not not on my 2023 bingo card Mm -hmm. (laughs) but I mean that's a legitimate concern right are your Nikes made in a sweatshop yeah is your Apple phone you know is your iPhone being made in a essentially a sweatshop today yeah like these are things that people consider, um, and there are things like you know even we joking about the Activision stuff, but like that's a concern, right? Yeah. yeah. Are people making video games in environments that aren't quite sweatshops, but are unhealthy environments mm-hmm. where they're being taken advantage of and abused in some situations? Yeah. Um, and that's not something we've traditionally had to worry about. But like we haven't worried about it because we were, we very conveniently did not know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, right. It's not that this is new or this wasn't happening. The investment of Saudi Arabia may be new, but there were bad people buying video games, investing and producing them, and there were certainly um, abuses going on in the video game industry going back decades. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, I mean, some of those stories have started to leak out now. We like know. You know, some bad situations were going on, mm-hmm. unfortunately. Right. Um, so there's some goodness in that light is being shined on this, but sometimes when the light's shined in the corner, you suddenly realize you're living with roaches, mm-hmm. which is not a happy feeling. Um, yeah, I am. Um, I Sorry, I mentioned this okay. the last time I was on the podcast, but, like, you know, I don't consider myself, like, a hardcore gamer. Like, I enjoy games, but, like, I, I don't – claim to be like an expert or anything. And so I guess this conversation is just really making me think about being like a more conscientious consumer because um, kind of like what like Alicia was saying is like, we think about this with other forms of media or the products that we buy, but like, I never really thought about it with video games before. So, so yeah, it's given me a lot to think about. Yeah. And we should be very clear. We're critical of video games because we like video games. Yeah. 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 And we think they should be better. Yeah. And the people are surrounding them should do better yeah. and mm-hmm. be better. Um, not because we're bashing video games or saying video games are a bad industry. No. Um, this is unfortunately the sort of behavior that goes on in all sorts of industries. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, let's talk about something a little happier. They're making a Tetris movie. It <laughs> actually looks amazing. <laughs> I watched the trailer this morning and I'm like, okay. <laughs> this, why is this only on Apple TV? <laughs> <laughs> so if, if you haven't seen the trailer, you should go watch it. They are making a story about how the rights to Tetris were bought um, so that they could be, it could be included with the Nintendo Game Boy when it first launched. And um, it's a weird looking Code War thriller, <laughs> which is not at all what I ever expected out of a Tetris mm-hmm. video game movie. <laughs> I, see, I played hundreds, if not thousands, of hours of Tetris yeah, over same. over my life, and never, when I was doing that, did I think a Cold War thriller would be would be the Tetris movie. And yet, I was looking <laughs> through the comments on the trailer, mm-hmm. and people were like, "No, like they they don't even have to like you know Hollywood's going to embellish it, mm-hmm. but they don't have to embellish yeah. it." If mm-hmm. you look up, there's a, I think it's video games knowledge is the youtube channel and they mm-hmm. have a video about the his the history behind mm-hmm. all this and it's wild yeah <laughs> yeah there's a a really good graphic novel that tells the history of tetris 
um, mm-hmm. which was you know kind of weird and interesting, like a graphic mm-hmm. novel on the history of Tetris. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, it's, it's an insane story, and it's not even one that I feel like I know all of it, and I've heard some mm-hmm. of the story at least. Right. Uh, so yeah, like it looks cool. It looks exciting. And like, had you told me 10 years ago, they're going to make a Tetris movie and you're going to be really excited to watch it. I would have been like, what? Right. If you had told me last month, you're going to be angry that the Tetris movie is only on Apple TV and you can't watch it. <laughs> I would have been like, no way. Mm-hmm. Maybe we need to have a screening when that comes out and we can all watch it. Yes. Um, it seems like everything is falling into place for them. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I heard they had a really hard time finishing the script, though. Mm. Every time they finished a line, it disappeared. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Lots of writer's block. <laughs> I, too, enjoy Tetris. <laughs> <laughs> I also like puns. <laughs> Oh my gosh, um, that was beautiful. I feel like also, like, we talk about Tetris the one week Ryan's not here. I know, because yeah. they're always like, that's what I've been playing. And yeah. yeah, they told me that, too. They, they do play a lot of Tetris. Yeah. Uh, shout so, out to Ryan. We, we do this. Whenever somebody's not here, that's when we talk about the thing they're really into. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So uh, we should probably save this next story until next week when Alicia may not be here. <laughs> <laughs> Why would I not be here next week, Justin? <laughs> I don't know. Your, your controller cat. update emergency. <laughs> yeah, your cat's holding you hostage. <laughs> um, Sega says Sonic Frontier sales, quote, greatly exceeded expectations. Um, yeah, I mean... I, this is always, of course, kind of difficult to know, like, what were their expectations? Uh, Square Enix was uh, infamous for having insane expectations. That was part of their dissatisfaction with the Tomb Raider games. They expected each of those games to sell, like, 30 million copies, mm-hmm. which no one ever thought would happen. <laughs> um, but, you know, Sega, this is obviously still their big franchise, um, yeah, uh, you know, this is their go-to franchise that, as we've talked about on here before, like continues to sell, you know, despite everything. Well, you know, I've talked about this before, but the people who, the people at Sega who run everything with Sonic are very in touch with fans. Mm. And right. so, you know, I, I'm wondering when they say it greatly exceeded expectations, I'm like, okay, is that your expectations from when the first stuff was released and it looked stiff and everyone was like, this is going to be awful Mm -hmm. or like were your expectations shifted when the marketing got turned Mm -hmm. around and it started looking as good as it actually is. Right. Cause greatly, you know, it from the initial reactions, if they looked and based their expectations off of those initial Mm -hmm. reactions, then yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. This is greatly exceeding that because those initial reactions, everyone was like, oh, God, it's going to be Sonic 06 again. <laughs> yeah. And maybe their expectations are still at Sonic 06. And so anything oh, Sonic, is going to oh, be Sonic 06, time. they had huge expectations. Because <laughs> <though, laughs> yeah. they rushed that out for the 15th anniversary. That's mm-hmm. part of why the game is so glitchy. Right. But, I mean, now their expectations are like, oh, we, we know all of the things <laughs> surrounding <laughs> Sonic 06. So our expectation is we'll sell two. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, those games... Even the bad Sonic games have sold Mm -hmm. very well for them, is my understanding. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. That this is a sort of evergreen franchise at a level that I think people don't often appreciate. I know I don't appreciate because I feel like, Mm -hmm. oh, we're still churning out more of the 3D Sonic clones. And Mm -hmm. then somebody's like, no, this they sell like 10 million each. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, that's insane. (laughs) (laughs) Um so, and I think definitely with this, they probably did have pretty high expectations because this is something that they went back to the drawing board, right? This mm-hmm. was a new Sonic game that obviously they they could have just churned out another Sonic Forces, mm-hmm. and they didn't do that, right? They yep. put some real money and time into this. Yeah. And they also, like, very clearly had a marketing plan because they refused to delay this game. When people were saying, hey, this game looks bad, they said, yeah, we're not delaying it. Yeah, we're not doing this right. Like we have a plan, so I don't think that plan obviously was to sell as many copies as they are, <laughs> according to their statements. But well, it's just really great to see. You know, we we've seen this multiple times with with Sonic fans. Like when 
say when they listen to fans and you know are able to turn things around like that i think sonic fans are really passionate about showing their appreciation for that mm -hmm. you know it's like when they first said they were delaying the sonic movie to redesign sonic because of the negative reaction mm -hmm. Everyone was like, okay, it doesn't matter how bad this movie is. Go see it in theaters. Because mm -hmm. even if the movie is terrible, we need to show them that we appreciate that they did that. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think, again, with this, like, when they turned the marketing around, it's, people started seeing, like, okay, you know, <laughs> we had these problems with the initial marketing releases where it looked really stiff and all that, and now it feels like they're actually listening mm -hmm. to us and, and making it, a more fluid game and all that. So we're going to show up and, you know, how do you show your appreciation for a company? You buy their thing. <laughs> right. You give them your money. Yeah. So, I mean, this is good because this game turned out better than expectations yeah. by, you know, obviously Alicia, by your comments, but also other comments we've heard from people and, you know, My, my comments were very much in, in line with, everybody else <laughs> well i mean amelia when she was on right yeah. very much talked it up as well um so yeah this is good this is good news to hear that it is meeting with you know maybe they'll put even more time and more money into the sequel no well, i know and, they've talked mm -hmm. about you know one of the things that fans have gotten kind of met on is the boost mechanic mm-hmm you know, especially like Sonic Forces, all you really do is hit boost the entire time. Right. And so with this one, they still have the boost mechanic there, but incorporated much better to where it's not just constant. That's how you get through everything. Right. And they've said like they want to start phasing that out because they know fans don't enjoy it anymore. Yeah. Like it was a great gimmick for one game and then it's just taken over. So. Yeah. And I think that's the one complaint I've heard about this game. Um, is those 3D behind the back sections are the least interesting part of it for a lot of people because well, what they're really interested in is all the new stuff. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think they do need to do some work there. Um, we're just about out of time, though, so let's get to our big question. And we just passed Valentine's Day this past <laughs> Tuesday. Um, so which video game character to you is the most romantic character. And OJ, who is the apple of your eye in the video game world? <laughs> okay. So or who do you think would romance you the best? <laughs> <laughs> so th this is romantic slash kind of on the, the creepy side. But um, <laughs> Setzer, because right, of course I'm going to pick Final Fantasy VI, right? Um Setzer in Final Fantasy VI because he's a gambler that travels the world in his airship and he falls in love with the singer Maria and then kidnaps her. But, <laughs> uh, and it ends up being Celeste. So he, you know, it's not exactly the situation that he wanted. But, so while that's creepy, <laughs> when I'm sitting here playing it the first time on Super Nintendo, I'm like, oh, wow, this, this handsome world-class traveler with his own airship came in and fell in love with this opera singer, and that's so romantic. Uh, and now now that I am twice over twice the age that I was when I played that, I realize how creepy it is. But still in my mind, Setzer is this grand, gigantic, romantic gesture of coming in with his airship and kidnapping her during the middle of a show. Justin's face this entire yeah. time has <laughs> just so, been so done. Yeah. <laughs> right, no, no, I know. <laughs> I know. I, I understand the implications of what I'm saying. Uh, oh but uh, still, uh, like, that's who I thought of when I read this question, is what I should say, is because it did have that such a thing in my mind when I first saw it, even uh, he, though I know much better now. He's definitely like the lovable rogue in that. That's yeah, what they're going yeah. for with that character in that game. Yeah. It's yeah. only upon reflecting about what actually happens uh -huh. in that game. <laughs> right. You know, where you're like, he's kind of a creep, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you don't think too hard about it, right, it's beautiful. Right. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> There's a lot of stories like that. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and I could also say Jack from Final Fantasy Stranger of Paradise because he <laughs> loved the world so much that he went back in time and became chaos. 
That's 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 <laughs> peak romance right there. <laughs> I wasn't expecting a Stranger of Paradise reference uh, for romance, uh-huh. but yeah, we'll take what we can get. Um, let's see, Carly. So my immediate first thought when I saw this question was Leon S. Kennedy from Resident uh. Evil uh, for a few reasons. He's very lean. He's in super good shape. Um, he knows martial arts and knows how to use firearms. And he has that really nice, <laughs> like, wispy hair. But also, too, I think back to Resident Evil 4 where he finds, like, the president's daughter and he's just, like, escorting her around. And I'm like, you know what? I could be her. <laughs> and then just have him, like, lead me around and, like, protect me and stuff and make me feel, like, safe. But he'd also make, like, snarky remarks. And I'd be like, ha <laughs> So... <laughs> So for me, Leon S. Kennedy is, he's it. <laughs> I like to think that the behind the back camera is just like me following him. That's my perspective. Just following him wherever he goes. I do like that one of your qualifications for romantic is good with firearms. <laughs> <laughs> the most essential trait, honestly. I know what I like. Um, Alicia. I, I, I just want to say I would be very romantic with Chris Redfield. So I, I get it. I respect that. He's yeah. too bulky for me. Mm-hmm. I like the I like the lean runner swimmer build mm-hmm. of Leon, but mm-hmm. but I get it. <laughs> hey, but then we can double. That actually be really fun. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do this. Well, yes. no. <laughs> do you know what a double date with those two guys would turn into? <laughs> All sorts of things would be trying to kill you. Yeah. But they keep But uh, they Leon would protect us. us. Leon would keep me safe. Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't count on that. <laughs> I played Resident Evil 4, and I got her killed a lot. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Fair. Save often, folks. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. Uh, Alicia. I mean, if if we're going with character that we have a crush on... (laughs) Rufus Shinra could punch me in the face and I would say thank you. <laughs> <Dang>. <laughs> also good with firearms. Yeah. Also very problematic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of unhealthy <laughs> relationship dynamics being exposed here. <laughs> I feel like we need to bring in a counselor to next week's episode. <laughs> Um, These aren't healthy people that have relationships. <laughs> We're just going to no, go beat if, our feelings up in the parking lot. Yeah. <laughs> if we want a healthy, rom- like a video game character that is actually romantic and a healthy romance, I I got to go with Damien Bloodmarsh from Dream Daddy. <laughs> oh, okay. Like that's that actually a healthy romantic character. Mm-hmm. That's actually a good answer. I, <laughs> <laughs> I wrote that down and then y'all started saying like, fun answers so i was like well i have to mention that rufus could punch me in the face and i would say thank you Uh, fair (laughs) okay especially remake rufus Mm -hmm. yeah he gets two punches you get two (laughs) (laughs) justin's like i don't know what to do with this I was going to say Princess Daisy because she she has a good body. <laughs> and I, I felt a little creepy saying that, but I feel so much healthier after listening to the preview. <laughs> now, it, it's become sort of like a meme that um, in um, – was it Super Mario Strikers when Daisy's in that they gave her like this big rump and everything uh, and <laughs> it's kind of like funny and so like you know she's like the more fun princess over uh, over um, Peach mm-hmm. and so yeah I mean I don't know I, I've never I don't know that I've ever had a crush on a video <laughs> game character um, you know, I don't know. I would have to think about it. But, like, if I'm thinking of, like, who would I want to go on a Valentine's date with, it would it would probably be Daisy would be my easy answer. Um, she was going to be my answer because I was thinking about, like, for female characters as well. And I was going to say her, but I haven't spent as much time getting to know her as I have with Leon. And that's what it came down to. Well, I think part of it is, too, I've had the uh, original Super Mario Land on my mind recently because they mm. added the Game Boy games to Switch. Um, and so I was thinking about it, and that's where she's introduced. And so I was, I guess she's just kind of been on the mind uh, as much as video game, like, <laughs> <laughs> characters are on my mind. And I feel like they're, they're on your minds a lot more. <laughs> and, and again, like, we may have to call in a therapist <laughs> for our next episode. <laughs> 
<laughs> These are not healthy relationships. <laughs> they're not meant to be healthy. <laughs> I'll say, to be fair, we acknowledge that they're not. <laughs> if, if your video game protagonist is abusing you, please <laughs> seek help. <laughs> but I, so I talk, I can't remember what, what number wise, which one it is, but the Resident Evil with uh, Chris Rev, Redfield's bice, or triceps that were on display the whole time. That's five, uh, I think. Five, yeah. yeah. I, I, that, okay, that's what I thought. I, it's, it's Chris Redfield's bicep, or tricep is that the number for me. Uh-huh. But um, <laughs> I talked about it so much that some people that I worked with went out and bought me a Chris Redfield doll. Uh, <gasps> and so it was... <laughs> like a little figure or like yeah, a plush doll? A little figure. Oh, okay. Uh, type. Um, oh my God, they like went great. out of their way to buy it for me just because I talked about him so much. So. He's so big. I'd like it if they made an action figure line where mm-hmm. like it was different Resident Evil characters and they all had a piece of Chris Redfield for a build a figure and the build was <laughs> Chris Redfield. <laughs> <laughs> Collect them all and you get a giant Chris Redfield. <laughs> You're running into like some that sort of stuff exists like the the, uh, the body pillows uh-huh. yeah. like out Japan and everything. They have those of every video game character. Yeah. So if you really want it i'm sure i'm sure there's a chris redfield one um all right that does it for this week's uh episode next week we'll be back with uh lots of lots of deep introspection <laughs> and, and maybe with a guest star who is also a therapist <laughs> yeah. um you know really asking ourselves some tough questions about <laughs> relationships and what we're looking for um, but no, that, that feels <laughs> really fitting given Valentine's Day. So that worked out quite well. Uh, I want to thank uh, OJ and Alicia as always, and certainly Carly for uh, filling in this week for Ryan. Thank you, Carly. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, and thank you to everyone listening. You can check out more at salukigames.com. And we'll be back next week with another episode. Bye.